Okay, welcome to day two and to our measurements and methods morning. The regular attendees among you will notice that we've pushed the alliteration theme that bit further this year by adding measurement alongside methods. Um, so we have four papers, two papers focused on measurement, one paper that kind of bridges measurement and methods, and then one that is a methodological piece. And I'm going to just very briefly summarize them in order. Uh, so Melissa is going to talk to us about how we might develop a measurement um, a way of measuring that we can, means we can move beyond statements like institutions matter. So this paper provides a systematic characterization of education bureaucracies in terms of the completeness and coherence of public basic education systems. She's going to talk about three functions and three t task dimensions and use this framework to collect data for four middle income countries. And this is something Lant is going to love, I know, that the, there's a strong correlation between the coherence measure and student achievement. It's positive. Okay. Uh, Noam is going to talk about um, a new data set where he measures learning across 100, he and co-authors, many of whom are in the room, measure learning across 164 countries. The aim there is to produce a globally comparable um, measure of uh, learning. And that's going to feed into the Human Capital Index, which we're going to hear more about in the lunchtime session from Penny. Um, so the key thing here methodologically or in terms of measurement is how to construct a learning exchange rate that means you can link international assessments such as PISA and TEMS to regional counterparts. And, and Noam is going to explain to us how that works, and then he's going to tell us the results of that exercise. Then moving on to Emily's paper, which kind of bridges both measurement and methods. So she's going to talk about cheating in Indonesian national exams. So as she mentioned to me, um, seeing a linkage to the, to the session, which might not, might not be obvious to everyone, if, if, you, uh, if you can't get a sense of cheating, then in a way you can't measure learning. Methodologically, she's going to introduce something called the N integrity score and tell us how that helps to get a, a handle on how much teaching there is. And she's going to tell us who cheats and by how much in Indonesian um, exams. It's quite startling that 34% of students are cheating and inflating scores by as much as 15%. Then Eduardo is going to finish the session by talking about uh, meta-analyses. They're increasingly common within the field of education. And uh, the question here is, are researchers understanding the results in the right way? And he's going to talk us through prediction intervals rather than confidence intervals, um, that, uh, where prediction intervals take into account the differences between studies. And his bottom line is going to be that there's so much heterogeneity, this calls into question the whole idea of identifying what works. Okay, so that's what we have in front of us. So I'm going to hand straight over to Melissa. Okay, thank you, Claire, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Edelman. I work in the Education Global Practice at the World Bank. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you this morning, and I hope you've had your morning coffee because I'm going to dive into the very exciting topic of bureaucracy uh, for the next 15 minutes. Um, okay, so. Uh, the research that I'm presenting to you is uh, pretty new. We're just finishing it up. And it's a paper with several of my colleagues at the bank, some of whom are here. Um, and it's part of a broader research project on education management in Latin America. Um, and this particular um, effort is really trying to, to dig a little bit more into bureaucracy. Um, and the sort of general motivation for this research is really the same as the motivation for, for RISE, essentially, right? Which is that we know that education systems in developing countries are not producing as much student learning as, as we think they could or should, um, that Noam will also talk about uh, next. Um, in Latin America in particular, uh, a lot of people think it's a first order problem for Latin America and helps to explain sort of the region's uh, relatively disappointing growth performance over the past several decades. Um, so we know um, of the many factors that could go into the education production function that the level and quality of inputs matter and we know that behind those inputs there are institutions um, and there is a literature that uh, makes the case for the importance of institutional characteristics and when I say that I mean things like uh, autonomy, um, um, accountability, the structure of the markets, or the extent of private sector competition, that sort of thing. So we have some, uh, some pretty good literature that shows us that this does matter. Um, but obviously moving from saying, OK, well, institutions matter to if we change specific institutional features, this is what we expect to happen, is quite complicated for, for many reasons. Um, and so what we end up seeing is that most quantitative research focuses either at the level of elected politicians and you know, using elections for identification strategies, which is uh, quite nice and important, 
or at the level of frontline service delivery. So for us in education, that's usually school, school teachers and school principals. Um, and then leaves basically in between those two, uh, kind of a black box of bureaucracy. Um, and so with this project, you know, we were looking at education management in Latin America, and we had several research papers on the school level, but we thought to ourselves, okay, we really, really can't leave it just at that. We have to figure out some way to try to address kind of this bureaucracy in between. And so this is kind of the genesis of, of where this idea came from. So basically, this is, this is what we asked ourselves, is whether we could try to construct quantitative and meaningful measures of bureaucracy in education. So we start actually from a 2006 paper by Lant and a co-author, Virad Pandey, that basically conceptualizes education bureaucracy as a set of functions, and then each function as a set of tasks. And we use that conceptualization to develop new measures um, that try to answer a series of questions. So the questions that we try to answer are here. So basically, um, we, try to ask our, we try to answer whether tasks are clearly articulated and allocated in regulation. So in legislation, we call that sort of de jure. We ask also whether the allocation, what, alloc what level the allocation is in terms of the, the education system. Um, we don't have a normative stance on this necessarily, but we think it could be informative. Um, and then we ask whether bureaucrats share a common understanding of that task allocation. So with each other, and also whether their, their understanding matches up with the de jure allocation. Um, and then finally, we also try to construct measures of how well tasks are actually executed. And then we ask ourselves, are these measures meaningful? So in terms of whether a uh, common understanding of allocation matters for execution, and whether either of those things matters for actual student learning. Okay, so um, you know we see this as, as being related to several different strands of literature that you are all probably very familiar with, so I will not spend time on that. Um, and so I'll go through, since this is a, a method session, um, a bit more in detail about exactly what we're, we are doing. So essentially, you know, going back to the, the Pritchett and Pandey framework, we identify basically 10 core functions that are within the purview of, we'd say, probably most countries' uh, basic education systems. Um, for us, you know, we're taking a Latin American view because that's where we did this research. Uh, so, you know, we could discuss and adjust based on the actual context. But in the Latin America case, these 10 seem to us to be sort of the right set. Um, and then each function we define as being made up of tasks in three dimensions. So essentially planning, implementation, and sort of monitoring and identification of problems. So this was to try to capture the different types of tasks that a function would really consist of that would be, be, that would be done within a bureaucracy. Um, and so this is specifically what I'm talking about. So these are the 10 functions that we have. So everything from learning materials, student assessments, um, to a bunch of personnel functions. Um, and then we cross these with the, the monitoring, planning, and implementation dimensions, right? So doing this cross of these 10 functions by three dimensions is how we identify tasks. So we identified um, many, many tasks and spent a lot of time on trying to winnow down the list for basically for tractability to be able to collect data and not go around and try to ask people about you know, 300 things. So we winnowed it down to basically 51 tasks in that, in that function um, dimension crossing. And then we constructed instruments to try to capture these uh, measures of task allocation and task execution uh, that I talked about. So, Okay, so an example, a specific example to tell you what I'm talking about. So in the function of school directors, a school principal hiring an assignment. So these are some of the task allocation questions. So for example, um, the planning dimension, we asked about who is responsible for setting the qualification requirements that new directors must meet, right? Just as one example. Um, and then on execution, we asked questions like this, which is that the last time that a need for a new director was communicated, was that need met? And this was sort of a multiple choice answer um, that, that, uh, that we offered. Um, so, you know, everything from no, you know, that post was never filled all the way to yes, we got the right person uh, basically within a reasonable amount of time. So basically, this is what we have for all of the functions that I just showed you. 
Okay, so then we uh, applied this in four countries in Latin America. So Brazil, the Dominican Republic, Guatemala, and Peru. Um, only three states in Brazil, not all of Brazil. Um, and we picked these countries for a few different reasons. So one is, um, you know, we think they reflect different types of systems. So everything from sort of municipal uh, primary education in Brazil to sort of like uh, provincial um, responsibilities in Peru to much more sort of national um, national systems that are generally run from the center, like Guatemala and the Dominican Republic. Um, and then we uh, did three types of data collection. So we did a legislative review, structured interviews with system officials at different levels, and then um, phone surveys with school directors. Okay, so just to get into a little bit more on the actual data collection. <laughs> So the legislative review um, for each country, it was carried out by a sector expert and basically identifies what we call this de jure allocation of tasks as defined by the current legislation or regulation. Um, the structured interviews with the officials was, were also done by that same sector expert in each country. Um, you know, the, the sample selection process for this was, um, you know, basically taking advantage of our relationships with governments to help us identify the right people to interview um, and also sort of availability and that sort of thing. Um, and the instruments asked about the task allocation, like I mentioned before. And then if a respondent says that, yes, their level of government is responsible for a particular task, we then go on to ask them about task execution because they should, in theory, know. Um, and then the last set of data collection we did is phone surveys with uh, directors in each country. Um, and we used uh, a survey firm um, in Mexico to do this. So the way that we selected our sample was based on the system, uh, the, the local level system officials that we were able to interview from their local level is where we drew our random sample of school directors. Um, and so the instrument mirrors the structured interviews, but we ask school directors more questions about task execution because at the level of the school, they're going to see much more of the results of that execution, even if they're not the ones responsible um, for actually making those decisions. Okay, so what I'll do uh, with my remaining five minutes or so is just kind of give you a few highlights of, of the results that we have so far. Um, um, so basically just starting with kind of a de jure task allocation. So there are a couple of things that you could take away from this table. So um, as you would expect, because these systems are structured differently, we see that uh, task allocation varies the way you would expect it to. So in Brazil, where municipalities um, in most states run primary education, we see that that's where most of the tasks are actually allocated, right? So the local level in Brazil is the municipality. Um, versus Peru, which I mentioned before, has been in a process of uh, devolution of responsibilities sort of to the provincial level, which is the subnational level, and we see a good share of tasks there. Um, unlike the Dominican Republic and Guatemala, which are primarily still making decisions at the national level. So that is sort of, you know, I think telling us that we are measuring something that more or less makes sense. Um, and then the other thing that we found striking about these results is across those countries, regardless of the structure, um, relatively little is getting decided at the school level. Um, so, you know, whether or not you have a municipal system or a federal one or whatever. Um, and we think that this is relevant because a lot of our energy goes, you know, when I say us, I mean as the World Bank, the education practice, we spend a lot of energy on supporting schools directly at the school level. We talk a lot about school-based management. We talked about that here yesterday as well. Um, but we see that there are a lot of decisions being made, a lot of responsibilities being carried out above the school level. And uh, this to us suggests that maybe we're not paying enough attention to that you know, sort of black box of bureaucracy in between where important things are happening. So that's kind of the takeaway from there. Okay, and so moving on from task allocation to what we call here coherence. So um, for us, you know, we were thinking about calling this coherence or alignment or whatever, but basically we're, we're considering this common understanding as a form of coherence. Um, and what we're measuring is basically a couple of things. One is whether there's a common understanding between the de jure allocation of tasks and the de facto perceptions of bureaucrats. So that's one. 
Now, the second is, okay, well, given that lots of organizations have unwritten rules, maybe the rules don't really matter that much as long as everybody has a common understanding of what should actually be happening. So we also look basically at de facto coherence among bureaucrats themselves. So we measure that in two ways. One is school directors with their local official, that person that we interviewed, and then just school directors among themselves within a locality. So for us, I think, you know, related to the RISE framework to Lance paper from 2015, we're sort of diving uh, very in detail into um, the, the delegation element of, of management, basically, is, is sort of where this, we see this fitting within the overall RISE framework is, is really in there. Um, and so we use these, these measures of, of what we call incoherence um, to, to see sort of what, what the, the state of, kind of, of, of task understanding is across the countries in our sample. So basically, you know, kind of one of the headline statistics is across the countries that we have, the four countries and the levels of, of the system, um, bureaucrats correctly identify about 56% of their tasks, their de jure tasks is their own. Sorry, this slide is, this, uh, is wrong. It's not 56% of bureaucrats. It's bureaucrats identify 56% of their tasks correctly as their own. So there's quite a bit of bureaucrats saying that they're responsible for things that they're not responsible for um, and saying that they're not responsible for things that the legislation says they are responsible for. So there is that. But there is, I'll show you in a second, that there's a lot of variation. Um, and then across countries, again, 44% uh, of tasks are coherent between school directors and their local officials. And within, local, uh, sorry, within school directors themselves, they're more coherent. So about 67% of tasks are coherent between school directors themselves within a locality. Um, but you know, probably more importantly, we see a lot of variation across countries. Um, so basically, this is looking from the perspective of a school, so the school director, their responses compared to their local officials and the legislation. And basically, this is sort of a measure of full coherence. So each observation is a school director. So if a school director, basically what we're measuring is um, the school director's responses to task allocation and then uh, how, whether or not their responses match up with both their local officials and the legislation, and so we call that full coherence. So you can see that there's quite a range. So in Guatemala, on average, school directors uh, are identifying 13% of tasks as being fully coherent. So they're giving the same response as everyone else, um, all the way to uh, Brazil, where 47% of tasks are fully coherent. So there's a lot of variation. Um, and so basically then we, you know, just to give you and the last 20 seconds kind of a suggestive idea of what we're looking at now um, and still working on this is, you know, are these measures meaningful for something? So we just run very simple regression looking at this kind of measure of full coherence on um, the outcomes of the latest uh, national student assessment that we have for all the countries except Guatemala. Um, and so, you know, here's the table that I'll show you for two seconds where basically we do get um, uh, a strong uh, negative correlation, sorry, a negative correlation here between incoherence and student learning. So basically, um, to put that in terms, we've got 51 tasks. So for every five tasks that are incoherent, if you add five more, then that's a 0.2 standard deviations lower student learning outcomes. Um, and so what we're doing right now is working on those tax, task execution measures to see um, if the, this relationship that we're seeing is explained by the quality of task execution. Um, so yeah, we've got lots of things that we're thinking about. Obviously, this is only looking at this management piece. Um, we haven't looked at financing at all. So it's one thing to be responsible for something. It's another to have the financing to do it. And so um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Have, oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. I was wondering just how to get this to work. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, excited to share this paper, Measuring Human Capital, with co-authors, 
uh, Penny Goldberg, who's here, uh, Simeon Jenkov, and Harry Petrinos at the World Bank. Uh, and I know it's a measurement session. I actually took out some of the measurement details, but I'm happy to come to that in the Q&A because uh, you only have 15 minutes, so you have to pick. Uh, so kind of starting with the definition of human capital, interesting as we kind of looked at this, the, the precise definition is not uh, kind of word by word agreed on, but notionally uh, knowledge, skills, competencies embedded in people uh, that, that contribute to productivity. Uh, so there's a rich theory linking human capital to economic development, starting uh, with Becker kind of formally uh, and popularizing this in, in economics and, and quite a rich theory on this. You see the big H uh, in the aggregate production function. This is really core uh, in economic theory. Uh, typically, it's been proxied by measures of schooling, uh, partially because this data has been available across many countries and over time. So there's very famous databases uh, such as Barrow Lee, Cohen Soto, uh, and others, and it was sort of considered a pretty good proxy uh, uh, for, for a long time. Uh, we know, and most people in this room know, and Lan has been saying, and many, many others in the World Development Report 2018, uh, that schooling does not necessarily produce learning. Uh, so this is just one graph, but this has been shown many times. This is enrollment rates increasing. This is from Lee and Lee. Uh, and this is our measure of learning, showing that it's actually stagnating uh, uh, over the last 10 years. I wouldn't overinterpret this. There's a few things driving this, but this just shows the, the striking contrast. Uh, so schooling does not necessarily produce learning. Uh, we know from, from a lot of accumulating literature that uh, schooling can sometimes fail to deliver on the predictions from these economic growth theories. Uh, so some, some literature on this. Uh, but when you use learning, you get much stronger uh, associations. So a very famous paper by Hanushek and Wosman, uh, World Development Report 2018, chronicles this, this, this in depth. Uh, so this is a nice graph from the World Development Report, essentially showing that when you look at years of schooling, conditional on test scores, uh, to annual GDP per capita growth, uh, you're getting kind of a flat relationship, but with, with learning you're seeing that positive association. Uh, so can we come up with a better human capital measure on, the, on a global scale that actually measures knowledge and skills uh, and is available across countries uh, and over time? Uh, so there are uh, a bunch of assessments that do measure learning internationally. Uh, so some famous ones, PISA, TIMS, PEARLS, uh, but they mostly cover uh, kind of North America, Europe, a bit of Asia, some Latin America, but you can see a huge omission here in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and many other countries. Small sample size, N of 50 to 70, uh, so it's really kind of a small, a small sample, but also a, a certain tale of the distribution. So there maybe is a lot of things that, that we're not learning just from these assessments. Uh, and so in this paper, we aim to bridge this gap and we uh, put a lot of uh, learning outcomes on a kind of a global scale uh, and cover 164 countries from 2000 to 2017. You can see we are, we're able to fill out uh, a bunch of countries here. Uh, so in this paper, we're presenting uh, one of the largest globally comparable learning outcomes databases uh, and over time as well, very current data up to 2017. Uh, we also are going to share a few stylized facts that show how you might use this. So the goal of this paper is largely to actually produce a public good. Uh, which is this database, which we hope many, many folks use for research and policy. And we do show how uh, it, it can kind of be used in a series of applications that are, that are motivating. Uh, so this database is part of the Human Capital Index that the World Bank has recently launched. So this is a, a very nice infographic uh, that we did not produce, but uh, the World Bank did produce. Uh, and you can see the various components. One of is the harmonized test scores, harmonized learning outcomes, uh, among others. Uh, so methodology. Uh, there's a literature, uh, kind of economics slash education, uh, creating comparable learning outcomes. Uh, so there's quite a rich literature on this. Uh, the basic intuition is you actually do have a lot of learning assessments uh, in developing as well as developed countries. So uh, developed country often will be PISA, TIMS, PEARLS. But there's also a series of other assessments like SACMAC in East and Southern Africa, uh, YESA in Latin America, PASEC uh, in West Africa, uh, EGRA data as well. Uh, in a bunch of countries. So if you can find a way to sort of make these assessments speak to one another, uh, you, can, you can put them on a global scale. It's not that there's no learning data in developing countries. Uh, there actually is. It's just sort of making these speak to one another. Uh, so the basic intuition of what we do is we create a learning exchange rate between these various assessments. I've actually moved a bunch of the kind of details to the appendix, but I'm happy to come to it uh, if folks would love to discuss. Uh, but the basic intuition here is you can take a country uh, or a set of countries that participate in both assessments in the same point in time in the same year for the same subjects and schooling level. Uh, so say, for example, Botswana participates 
Uh, in Tim's 2011, you get a math and science score in primary schooling. Uh, they also participate in SACMAC primary schooling. Uh, they've also got math and science scores as well as reading. Uh, you can now see the relationship between these assessments, and there's various linking methodologies to then kind of produce that exchange rate. Uh, so that's the basic intuition for, for how this is done. And the more countries that participate in these sort of pairwise matches, the better this is, uh, and so forth. And there's sort of a series of assumptions that make this uh, uh, the most credible. Uh, we compare this to what is often considered the gold standard in linking methodology, which is item response theory. Uh, so in item response theory, there's actually overlapping test items between these assessments uh, and, and sort of a robust methodology for making those comparable. Unfortunately, there is not enough item overlap in all of these assessments over the same period and over all of these countries. But there is a project called the Lynx Project, uh, which takes a subset of countries that do have this uh, and a subset of kind of um, uh, subjects and levels. So it's mostly for reading and primary. And they do this from the 1970s, actually, for that. And so where there's overlap, we're able to see how well our methodology does relative to, to this item response theory. This is, I believe, from 2000, 2015, a kind of average score. And you see that, that our methodology does really well at the macro level uh, with a correlation of over 0.97. For anyone who's worked with test scores, which I know as many folks here, we know test scores are quite finicky. But at the macro level, it seems to be really robust. Uh, and we actually compare it to a few other methodologies, equipercentile linking as well. Uh, so I have a bunch of those comparisons in the appendix. And again, uh, we're seeing over a 0.98 correlation uh, among these. So it's doing pretty well. Uh, so just to describe the database, it covers over 98% of the world from 2000 to 2017. So we think that's pretty good. We're still adding more countries uh, in, in the future updates. Uh, the database itself, we sort of have a cookbook in the paper for, for how you might use it and the various variables. The goal is to be pretty disaggregated. So a lot of these kind of past databases have been very aggregate. Uh, and there's a lot that's kind of hidden in, in there. So uh, sort of combining different schooling levels, primary and secondary, by, across subjects. We actually disaggregate this. So you have uh, mean scores. You have it by year, uh, not just five-year intervals, by exact year, uh, by level, primary versus secondary, by gender. Uh, by subject, by original test, so you can see where the data is coming from, uh, as well as standard errors to quantify uncertainty. Uh, and it's going to be publicly available and updated at regular intervals. And the goal is to really have this kind of transparent so users of the data can actually see and get a sense of how this data is all coming, coming together. Uh, so a few just kind of descriptives here, put, putting some country, kind of selected countries. Uh, so one, you can see Russia has pulled ahead of the US. Uh, that's actually largely driven by their recent pearls data, uh, for those who've been following that. Uh, Chile, a uh, bunch of kind of the top Latin American countries outperforming some of the Eastern European counterparts, Georgia. Uh, Saudi Arabia, relatively rich, not doing so well. Uh, at the bottom here, you'll, this is kind of a trend that's known. A bunch of the sort of resource-rich countries not producing the level of human capital uh, that their wealth might predict. And a bunch of countries in Africa uh, at the tail end of the distribution. Uh, you see Singapore, this is the average score over 2007-2017. So this is capturing variation, these, these, uh, this plot. Uh, you can see Singapore doesn't have much. It's actually been kind of at the top for, for a while. Um, so potentially there's sort of a, a diminishing returns uh, effect here uh, that's kind of to be explored. Uh, Rwanda has low variation for a different reason. It just doesn't have much data. So this is to sort of just show that there's different reasons for this. And so kind of users of the database should do this uh, quite knowingly. Uh, Russia is, has high variation because it's improved relatively quickly, whereas South Africa has high variation because it's actually declined uh, relatively quickly. Uh, so this is another graph showing uh, GDP per capita, log GDP per capita relative to learning outcomes. So this sort of highlights uh, how wealth might predict uh, how well you do and a few trends that you can observe here. Some of these are not surprises because they're already known from sort of PISA, TIMS, et cetera, but Vietnam doing very well, uh, Singapore, Poland, Cuba, Bulgaria. Uh, on the lower end here, kind of lo lower than you might think from wealth, you're seeing a lot of the resource-rich countries, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, not, not matching up on human capital here. Uh, South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, India as well. Uh, and this is sort of a select set of, of large developing countries. So showing that sort of a, there's a distance to the frontier here, uh, given the wealth, there's actually scope to really kind of improve, improve human capital. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to be wealthy to achieve good human capital. Uh, this is another interesting descriptive. This is years of school. This is expected years of school from, from the Human Capital Index relative to, to learning. Um, so Ghana, we, we heard from uh, senior officials yesterday, does quite well uh, on years of schooling, but not so well on learning. Kind of a striking uh, example and, and outlier here. Uh, 
Uh, Kenya, on the other hand, does quite well on learning, uh, as well as years of schooling. That also was brought up yesterday. Uh, Vietnam, a few other uh, countries where you see doing relatively well on uh, expected years of schooling, but not on learning. Nigeria, South Africa, and India. I think just an interesting thing to highlight is uh, there's actually a lot of variation, conditional on years of schooling. There's a lot of countries that actually do produce uh, rel you know, much, much higher learning, showing that uh, it's not necessarily just a function of, of years of schooling. There's actually a lot of scope to improve conditional on years of schooling. Uh, stylized facts in four minutes. Uh, so this is by region. Uh, this is just enrollment rates. You can see uh, lower to start with in sub-Saharan Africa uh, and South Asia, but going up, uh, learning stagnating across most regions. Uh, again, I wouldn't, this, this sort of captures a few things. It captures a bit of kind of new countries coming into the database as well as same countries' performance over time. So you need to dig in further, and we have more on this in, in the paper to sort of fully interpret this, but this shows uh, the, rough, the rough trends. Uh, on gender, uh, you're seeing that the gender gap is flipped between enrollment and learning. So uh, whereas girls sort of under-enroll in school in many regions, in some it's on par, on learning you're seeing girls overperform. This could be driven by selection. Uh, and so kind of if you look at a few examples, in, in MENA, uh, girls are under-enrolled but overperform. So maybe it's just the ones that are in school are sort of the ones who, who kind of have higher scores. But other counterexamples in sub-Saharan Africa, under-enrolled uh, but still underperforming. So it's not clear selection is kind of the full part of the story here. There, there's sort of more to explore. Uh, Human capital, when measured by learning, has been shown to be associated with growth before, but a much smaller subsample. We actually show that this holds up really well when you include the global distribution. So this is encouraging. It wasn't just that this was the case for 50 countries. It actually does hold up pretty well across the entire uh, global distribution. So that's encouraging. And, and I believe this paper is one of the first to show that it's holding on, on just so wide a scale. Uh, these associations are heterogeneous. So one of the nice features of the database is because it's much larger, uh, you can actually get some heterogeneity because you're not just looking at five countries. You're, you're looking at a decent chunk. Uh, and so we find some interesting trends here. This is just one. We see that the association with growth for kind of current income status is highest on currently upper middle income countries. And looking at initial income quartile at the beginning of this period, uh, it's that second quartile. So this is interesting because it might suggest that there's sort of a human capital sweet spot uh, where sort of potentially uh, maybe on the sort of low, low end, just the labor markets aren't rewarding human capital in the same way yet. Uh, maybe they're, they're, they're not as thick. So there's sort of a variety of reasons. Uh, but sort of on this, this middle space, there's potentially kind of a sweet spot uh, to, to be explored further. But you can actually get at heterogeneity with this database, which has not really been, been as possible before. In a final stylized fact, development accounting. So there's, there's a very large literature on this uh, trying to explain uh, cross-country income differences uh, attributed to human capital. It's largely unsettled and it varies pretty wildly from potentially zero to almost everything. Um, so that's kind of as, as wide an interval as you can get. Uh, one of the reasons, there's a few reasons for this, is because it's been hard to measure quality. Uh, and so there's been a lot of kind of efforts to measure quality directly uh, uh, and simply. Um, and, and so you see this wide variation. Uh, so this is just sort of one baseline accounting result. Uh, and you can see for kind of some of the earlier studies in this literature, which largely used uh, quantity measures enrollment, uh, the share of human capital hovered around kind of 10%. Uh, but when you use quality, uh, we're finding it's closer to 20% double uh, on these decompositions. Uh, that's close to Shulman 2011, which uses immigrant returns to also try to get at quality. So that's kind of nicely matching up. Uh, on another decomposition, uh, here, looking at the more recent literature that looks at quality, uh, we're, you know, which ranges from, from nearly all to potentially none, uh, we're finding that if you just set the parameter value to zero, so essentially this is years of schooling uh, on quality, I didn't have a chance to go into kind of full depth on, on sort of the, the parameter values of this. Uh, it's around that 20, 30 percent, which is close to what we were seeing before. Uh, if you're now looking at kind of returns to, to quality, and we look at various pieces here on the order of of 20% uh, and you're actually including quality, you're seeing this go up to, to 40%, which is close to some of the recent literature sort of in the middle here, 50 to, to 60%. So essentially, we're seeing that when you use this measure, you get something a bit more reasonable sort of in the middle of the literature uh, instead of this massive variation, zero, zero to, to everything. Uh, in conclusion, uh, seven seconds, uh, to understand and track human capital, 
uh, we think that, uh, and, and link it to economic development, there's a need for this compl com uh, globally comparable uh, learning outcomes measures. Uh, we construct a database of 164 countries from 2000 to 2017. Uh, covering 98% of the, the global population. Uh, the data is going to be publicly available and updated regularly, and, and we hope that, that many folks use it. Uh, in a first set of motivating applications, we present a few stylized facts. Schooling is not learning. That's no, and we sort of show that again. Uh, the gender gap seems to be flipped. Uh, learning is associated with, with growth on a global scale. Uh, associations with growth are heterogeneous, and there might be this sort of human capital sweet spot. There's other heterogeneity analysis you, you can run. Uh, and for the development accounting contribution, we're finding between a fifth to half, uh, which is roughly sort of in the middle of a wildly varying uh, uh, literature. Uh, so there's been large policy demand for this already. It's a core part of the human capital index. Uh, USAID has also included this in the country self-reliance, and actually this measure is starting to be included in a lot of different uh, indices and measures, which is exciting, uh, seeing learning putting at, put at the center uh, of these various efforts. Uh, in the future, we are going to add data. We're also going to improve the methodology over time, uh, so there's sort of a longer research agenda. Uh, and we also hope to isolate value added. So this is sort of uh, trying to get at some of these selection effects, potentially comparing household to school level uh, learning. So that's something that we hope to look at in the future, uh, and adding additional variables like returns, uh, et cetera. Uh, so thank you. So we'll wait for a bit. Yeah, so hi, I'm, uh, I'm Emily, and um, today I'll talk about joint work with my uh, teammates from the Rise Indonesia team, Menno Pradha and Daniel Suryadama and Arya Swanata, and uh, together with Rahmavati from the, uh, the testing arm of the Ministry of Education in Indonesia. Um, and I'll talk about cheating on national exams in Indonesia uh, where we're interested in uh, identifying how big this problem actually is in terms of exam scores. So yesterday, Apijit already uh, talked about um, that it is a big problem in, um, in India, and today I'll show you that it's also a big problem in Indonesia. So journalists have written quite a bit about uh, cheating on the national exams already, both in national news, uh, like on the on your left, and international news as an economist here um, on the right. And um, what they write about is that there's actually uh, cheating going on in, uh, throughout the, the exam procedure. So it already starts at the printing companies that are leaking answer sheets to the students. Uh, teachers are providing answers to the students and allowing students to copy each other's uh, answers uh, in the classroom. Um, and this cheating is all uh, sort of induced by the stakes that are attached to, to the exam. So the Indonesian national exam is used to measure two things, um, that is student achievement and school quality. So um, for students, it's, it's mainly the, their, their national exam score is mainly important for their acceptance into uh, secondary school and uh, university. So the national exam is taken in grades 6, 9, and 12. Um, and until 2016, it was also uh, a condition for their graduation. And for schools, it's mainly a reputation thing. So if schools score low on average on, on the national exam, they'll look bad and, well, they don't like it. So that way, both for students and for, for teachers and principals, there are incentives to cheat on, on the national exam. So. I think that every one of you here will agree that, that cheating is bad and, and should not be happening. But uh, so I would just like to emphasize two things. So first, um, when cheating is happening at a large scale at a national exam, that means that you're not actually measuring learning. While the national exam is one of the main information sources for, for government officials for uh, how much learning the education system is actually producing. And second, when students and teachers already know uh, beforehand that they can actually cheat their way through the exam, they might put less effort into studying and into uh, teaching in order to, uh, 
to, to pass, pass the exam. So um, yeah, in, in Indonesia, the exam pass rates are close to 100%, but according to the PISA, 42% uh, of the 15 year olds who are, most of them are in their exam year, are actually functionally illiterate. So how is it possible that all of these students pass their exam while they don't have uh, the skills necessary to do so? Well, it could be cheating. But uh, what we don't know is how big is this problem actually in terms of exam scores. So there's all this speculation about, about cheating in, in the uh, news articles, but yeah, how, how, how many schools are cheating and um, how much are they cheating? So in order to identify this, we uh, exploit a national policy implemented by the government of Indonesia for junior secondary schools. Uh, so since 2015, the government of Indonesia had been um, calculating this so-called integrity score. So what they do is there's this um, algorithm, and this algorithm checks if there's patterns in the answer sheets of the students, and uh, that way they can get a sense of, um, yeah, they can get suspicious of, of cheating uh, in, in these exam scores. Um, and they, they calculate this for all schools in 2015. And we combine this with another uh, intervention that they're doing, uh, which is computer-based testing. So with computer-based testing, students um, just get the, the questions directly from a server, circumventing these printing companies and the teachers. So um, they, cannot, they cannot do this, these traditional cheating practices as described in the news articles. And this is um, slowly being phased, phased in. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. So first, I'll explain a bit more about this integrity score. Um, so this this algorithm is um, developed by the, the by the testing arm of the Ministry of Education, and it's based on an already developed literature on um, how to uh, identify cheating based based on answer patterns. And it's a score that ranges between zero and hundred. Um, so a higher value means that there's higher integrity and less cheating. The government uses uh, a few cutoff values. Um, so they use, for example, a cutoff value of 70 to um, say that there's, for the schools that have a score lower than 70, uh, they feel that there's sufficient or like convincing evidence that there's substantial cheating uh, going on. Then between 70 and 80, it's, there's probably still cheating happening but it's they cannot they cannot be very sure about it and then for schools with an integrity score above 80 they believe that these are uh, honest schools that are are not cheating so here in the graph you see the distribution of the integrity score uh, with the red line indicating the the 70 uh, cutoff value most of the most of the uh, schools actually have a score around 80 but as much as 34 percent of the schools have a, a score below uh, below 70 in uh, 2015. So here you see the, the correlation between this, this integrity score and uh, exam scores. Up to uh, a score of 80, there's a clear negative correlation uh, between the, the integrity score and exam score. So um, as expected, the, the schools that are, that are scoring very low on this integrity score have a very high uh, very high exam scores. And then uh, when you look at the schools with an integrity score above 90, they also score very high. So these should be the very good schools. Um, but, uh, so in, but in order to see how much these schools are actually increasing uh, their scores, we use uh, the, the phase-based implementation of the computer-based testing. As I said before, the students get the questions directly from a server. So the printing companies cannot leak the answer sheets. Teachers and principals don't have uh, the answer sheets beforehand. And the students also get the questions in different order, and they actually get uh, different questions from this big item bank uh, that is uh, at the server. So it's also very difficult for the students to, to copy the answer. So we believe that it is actually basically impossible to, to cheat in this system, so that the computer-based test scores are reflecting um, the true learning um, outcomes of, of the students. Uh, so here uh, you see the, 
the faith-based implementation. So schools need to have sufficient uh, computers and they need to have access to electricity and access to internet to be able to implement the CBT. And when they think that they're ready, they can, um, they can apply to the, to the central government and the central government will check um, if they are actually ready and they can implement it. So in 2015 and 2016, actually pretty small number of schools have implemented because there's about 35,000 schools that fall under the Ministry of Education. But by 2018, 47% of the schools are, um, are implementing the CBT. Um, so here um, I plotted the, the trends of the exam scores of, of the groups of schools that implemented the CBT and this graph shows two things. First, uh, between the red lines uh, you see the difference between the year before implementing CBT, so when they were still doing the exam on paper, and then uh, the year that they actually implemented CBT. And what you see is that there's, um, there, there's a drop in scores between these, these years. And the second thing that it shows is that this, there, is, this is, the schools that are implementing CBT are not a, a random sample. So the schools that have high exam scores and uh, they also have higher integrity scores, those are the ones that uh, switched first. So to be able to say something about how much cheating is going on in, in the whole country, um, we, we also need to get a sense of uh, how much cheating is happening in the group that is not implementing CBT yet, which is likely to be more than uh, the schools that have switched so far. So how we, we do that um, by using this correlation uh, between the integrity score and, and the exam scores to predict what the non-cheating score would be for the schools that are not implementing CBT yet. So first, as I showed in the previous graph, well, and, and argued is that CBT uh, limits cheating. Um, then uh, sec the second thing I use and I'll show in the next slide is that the integrity score is actually very predictive of the drop in scores um, after these, these schools implement uh, CBT. And then I use the interaction between the paper-based score and the integrity score to predict the non-cheating uh, score for, uh, for the, for the uh, schools that are still doing the paper-based exam. Here you see this correlation between the integrity score and uh, the drop-in scores, as I said before. So on, on the x-axis you have the integrity score. This is the group of schools that uh, switched to CBT in 2017. And then uh, their paper-based scores in the year before, in, in 2016. So the as, as, as shown in the previous graph, the, 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 integrity, the schools with the low integrity scores scored very high on the paper-based uh, exam. But now that they're doing the, the computer-based exam, they, they actually halved their average, average score. And you see that up to the, the uh, threshold of 80, schools are dropping in, in their scores uh, one, once they switch to the computer-based testing. And um, yeah, the schools that have a higher integrity score uh, yeah, seem to have uh, only a small difference between the scores, which kind of confirms this threshold that the government is using with, uh, of, of, an, of 80, that above that, yeah, the schools are very unlikely to be, be cheating. So um, then I use this, the, the paper-based score and, and the integrity score and the interaction to predict the, um, the non-cheating uh, exam score for the paper-based schools. And here you see just a simple regression of the, uh, the computer-based score on these, um, on these um, indicators. And they significantly predict the, the CBT score. And despite that we only have school-level uh, average exam scores and we can only compare across cohorts of students, we reach uh, an R squared of 0.71 with this model, which means that the model explains 71% of the variation in the, in the CBT scores, which is actually um, pretty high. So it, the model predicts uh, fairly well. So using the, the paper-based score, uh, the predicted score for the paper-based schools and the CBT score for the uh, CBT schools, I can compare this computer exam score to the, the paper-based exam score. This is a, so a simple comparison uh, for all schools. So the, the school scored 57 on average on uh, the paper-based exam, uh, 
And then uh, once they do it on the computer, they score uh, about 48. So they, so this suggested they increase their scores by about 18% of their um, non-cheating score, so to say. And what we can also do is now split this sample between, uh, so into the, the cheating schools, with ha which have an integrity score below 70, and the, um, and the high integrity schools, which are uh, above the 80 threshold. And we see clear differences in the drop-in scores here, as we would expect based on the, on the correlation. So uh, the low integrity schools actually drop with uh, 20, 23 points on uh, their exam to uh, a score of 46 on average, which is uh, a, a, an increase of 49%. So this is very substantial. And then uh, for the high integrity schools, it's only uh, three points. Now, these high integrity schools are also dropping in score, but this is, could potentially be because these students still need to um, they still need to uh, learn how to use the computer, or um, the, the items might be a bit different over, over the years in the exam. So for the low integrity schools, we cannot assume that this full drop is due to the cheating. So we take the difference between these scores and say, okay, well, so due to cheating, these, uh, these cheating low integrity schools can increase their scores with 42%. So to conclude, um, well, cheating is substantial in, in Indonesia. 34% of the schools have, have low integrity according to this, uh, this integrity score, and they in increase their score with 42%. Now, there have been some, uh, some other studies that, that looked at cheating with the in integrity score in Western countries, so in, in Chicago and South Italy, and they found cheating in about 5 to 5% uh, and 14% of, of the exams. So in, uh, and as Abhijit also showed yesterday, um, in Indonesia and India, the problem is actually uh, much larger. And um, in when, when studying the learning crisis, it's very important to take this cheating into account. So um, when, uh, so the national exam is not measuring learning and students and teachers might not be uh, putting as much effort into studying and teaching because they know that they can just cheat their way through. So in our future, we're, we will uh, uh, study this hypothesis and see if after in, uh, implementation of the CBT, if schools are actually increasing their exam scores again, which should only be possible by uh, studying harder and uh, teaching better. So, thank you. Hi everyone, um, Eduardo Masset from SEDU, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, today uh, the difficulty in uh, generalizing evidence from impact evaluation studies of education interventions in international development. And um, in particular, uh, I'm going to talk about one method which is used for generalizing evidence, which is uh, meta-analysis. So these are examples of uh, meta-analysis of education interventions. Meta-analysis is uh, basically a quantitative summary of uh, the evidence of, uh, of, of interventions. And uh, in a typical meta-analysis, you have a list of uh, primary studies with a point estimate and confidence interval. And then you have a final summary statistics, which is the average of all uh, the results uh, from the primary studies. And uh, the goal of a meta-analysis is to find out um, what works, right? to, to, to get some general conclusions about um, the effectiveness of an intervention. Uh, now, you know, as you know, the, over the last 10, 15 years, there's been an exponential increase in uh, impact evaluations uh, in education. And uh, at the same time, understandably, there's been an increase in systematic reviews of, of, of these primary studies. Um, now, one thing that has been observed uh, about the systematic reviews and meta-analysis of education interventions is that they find uh, different results uh, in their conclusions, and sometimes even conflicting results. And, and that's been uh, uh, partly because uh, the different uh, reviews are using uh, different samples 
of, of, of primary studies. They're not looking actually the same studies. But I think that's only part of the explanation. The underlying reasons is because uh, there is so much heterogeneity in the results of the studies that uh, if, if, if the studies were homogeneous in results, taking different samples would not produce different results. So that's part of uh, what I'm going to argue today. Uh, but before discussing this, I want to introduce a couple of misconceptions of what meta-analysis is. Uh, the first misconception is uh, that meta-analyses are designed to identify um, a true universal general uh, effect. Uh, this, this misconception is uh, common, uh, particularly among people who uh, read the results of meta-analyses, not, not those that produce meta-analyses. Right? Those who produce meta-analyses have a second misconception. <laughs> And the misconception is uh, that the, 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 the average summary statistics of meta-analysis is a prediction of what would be the impact of, the, of uh, uh, another intervention in, in, the, same, in the same area. Um, to, to explain this uh, misconception, I'm going to uh, talk about briefly about the two uh, prevailing methods of meta-analysis that are being used, which is the fixed effects and random effects. So that relates to the, the misconception number one and misconception number two. So in a fixed effect meta-analysis, you start with the assumption that there is one general, true, universal effect that applies everywhere to everybody. Right. So different studies one might have different sampling distribution but they're they are, they are estimating the same effect. And therefore, as you add more studies, as, as you produce more studies, your, your, the result is that you're gonna, your results, will, on average, on expectation, will converge to the real, true, universal mean. Um, now, this, of course, is, it can be true in, in, in some very special cases, but I think everybody would agree that it's very unlikely that will happen in a social intervention, definitely not in education. Right? We do have uh, huge differences, uh, which I uh, summarize in three uh, categories. One is differences in populations. So you can't expect the same intervention to have the same impact in all countries. Um, there are differences uh, in implementation. You can, many times um, we label interventions like uh, teacher training, but actually when we look at what the project is, they're very different things. And, um, and then there are differences in the way um, the studies are conducted, the, the things are measured, and uh, um, in the quality uh, of the study. So there is a huge heterogeneity uh, intervention. And everybody knows that, and that's why people uh, now, nowadays use what is called a random effects meta-analysis. In a random effects meta-analysis, you don't believe there is a single universal true effect. But you believe that each study is estimating, is an estimate of its own true effect for that particular intervention. Uh, so in a random effects meta-analysis, there are two uh, uh, elements of variability. One is the sampling variability, but the other one is the variability between uh, studies. So you're, you're trying to put together uh, different results. Um, which, which means, uh, so at that point, was, then what is the meaning of the average effect in this case? So clearly is not uh, misconception number one. So the, 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 the meta-analysis, the random effect meta-analysis does not find what works in general, right? So that's not the effect. And what it finds is actually nothing else than the average of the observed effects, right? So that, that's, that's everything that uh, random effects meta-analysis says. Now, if it, that always comes at the same time with a confidence interval, which is actually measuring the accuracy of that mean. But it doesn't say anything about uh, the dispersions of effects across different studies, the heterogeneity. Uh, in order to estimate that, we need something which is called a prediction uh, interval that incorporates, in addition to the sampling variation, also the difference between um, uh, studies. In other words, what happens is the prediction interval is a confidence interval which is much wider than the, confidence, uh, the standard confidence interval. And the meaning of the prediction interval is uh, representing the range of effects that you can expect a new intervention to have, provided it's similar to the intervention that you have in a meta-analysis. 
So it is actually a concept which is much closer to um, um, a view of uh, using evidence for making decisions. And uh, I'm going now to illustrate what difference it makes uh, using uh, confidence interval versus production, uh, prediction intervals in education. And uh, I've been using the data from um, um, what is probably the, the, the largest uh, systematic review ever conducted in uh, international development on education, which is a study by uh, 3IE, which included 238 studies, uh, 216 programs, and they were classified in 20 different uh, um, intervention categories. And uh, the authors used a random effect meta-analysis in the paper. And they, and they use the confidence interval to um, test the hypothesis of whether intervention works or not. Uh, the conclusions are uh, that uh, um, when it comes to participation outcomes, uh, cash transfer um, work, and that uh, while it's, it's, um, school feeding is promising. And these are the only interventions that turn out to be effective. And when it comes to uh, learning outcomes, uh, the conclusion is that structured uh, pedagogy uh, is effective. Or there are a number of other interventions that are uh, also uh, promising. And that is based on, as I said, in confidence interval testing. Now I'm going to show <laughs> what difference does it make to use confidence interval versus prediction intervals. So the, the chart here on, on, on the left, are um, uh, these are meta-analyses. Each row is not a single study, but it's a meta-analysis with uh, uh, the, the estimate and the confidence interval. And you can see here the statistically significant result on, on cash transfers and school feeding. Now, when we're using um, uh, prediction intervals rather than uh, confidence interval, we have much wider uh, variation and uh, significance disappears. Um, there's only one case, uh, which is this one, uh, where you still have um, um, in a, a range of effect which is, um, is not crossing the zero line. Uh, but the reason is because there are only three studies in this category. So, yeah, so you cannot calculate um, the variance between studies because the number is too small. Um, it, you know, of course, it, it, it also calls the question whether it, is it, does it make sense to um, calculate an average of two studies or three. And maybe they should be analyzed uh, separately. It would be more informative. Um, school completion, we got similar results. Um, again, uh, tight uh, confidence interval. We have some uh, significant effects here, here again, um, uh, merit-based scholarship, but again, few studies, right? So uh, we were unable to calculate the, the prediction interval, but you can see how. And also pay attention, how, how large is the scale here? So we're going from minus 0.5 uh, standard deviations to, to one. So it's, it's, it's really, even if you look at the size, a very wide uh, range uh, of potential effects. Uh, these are uh, the same on te um, um, test score in, in, in mathematics. Again, you see here the uh, tight uh, confidence interval on, on pedagogy and uh, merit-based scholarship that disappear when you uh, look at uh, uh, prediction interval. Same result for reading test scores, um, uh, except for uh, meta-analysis using, using very few studies. So in uh, conclusion, what can we say about what works in education? <laughs> um, well, based on, 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 on the charts using prediction intervals, I think uh, you, you can't say that any intervention is predictably more effective than others, right? Um, we can also say there is a huge heterogeneity uh, in, uh, of effects. Um, and uh, mine, that, uh, it's, it's, it's my uh, uh, belief that this heterogeneity is actually underestimated. So the, there is more than it, it, it shows up here. And the reason is because in some cases, there are only a few studies for, for a given category. But those studies come often from the same country or from the same people. So if we were to expand the number of studies for that category, we will have even more heterogeneity. 
there is also an issue of uh, publication bias, where it's not just that it's the same people doing the same work in the same countries, but it's also that uh, is, 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 is positive results and tends to be published. Uh, right, and, uh, and so we are actually, um, there, there is a, a meta-analysis is not a random sample of uh, all possible studies, but it's, it's actually part of the production of knowledge and the use of knowledge. And, uh, and, and certainly, the, the, the process of producing knowledge operates to decrease uh, heterogeneity, to make studies more homogeneous, to, to look much uh, uh, more like each other. Um, is there anything that could be done to improve this? Um, well, I don't think, uh, one thing, one obvious thing that you said, well, you should improve, uh, uh, conduct more studies. Um, but that's unlikely to work, I mean, because it, it, Having more studies will not reduce the heterogeneity uh, in effects. So it, make, make, uh, it can make your, your mean can be more accurately be estimated, but the heterogeneity will still be there. Uh, I think uh, uh, one improvement could be in redefining intervention categories. I mean, there are things, for example, in the systematic reviews or meta-analysis that people do, and where they say teacher training or uh, uh, even cash transfer, they actually mean very different things. So the projects are very, very different from each other. So the, there is one way of reducing heterogeneity there by redefining uh, more narrowly the categories and conducting more studies uh, uh, for that particular programs. Um, finally, um, is, uh, is, uh, the, so the, the one question could be, is it worth doing a meta-analysis at all? And I think the answer, well, you may be surprised, but I think the answer is yes. I think it's actually a very useful exercise, uh, provided you interpret the results uh, correctly. So there is lots of useful information here. And in fact, uh, the goal of, but remember, is a misconception. The goal of a random effects meta analysis is not to, to find out what is the general effect, what, what works. It's actually the beginning of, of starting exploring the heterogeneity of effects. Because the assumption is that effects are heterogeneous. And so a meta-analysis should be the starting point for, to, to understand why interventions have different uh, results in different places and for different people and when they are uh, uh, conducted differently. So the answer is yes, I think uh, meta-analysis is still useful. And uh, the final comments for um, uh, conducting uh, single studies. Um, as I said, there's been a lot of um, 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 uh, evaluations in the last 10 year, 15 years, uh, particularly in the form of randomized controlled trials. Um, now, it, you should bear in mind that when you do a, randomized, a straight RCT, what it's doing is actually providing a data point for a meta-analysis. That's the ultimate goal of an RCT. And, and you have to ask yourself whether it's, it's, it's valuable exercise in education, for example. Um, this is not to say that we shouldn't do uh, RCT, no, not at all, but it, that at the same time, we should think when we conduct primary studies, uh, to do it in such a way uh, that we also bring an understanding of, uh, what, of the mechanism of the intervention, which can be a different way of uh, generalizing, but if the goal is uh, saying what works, uh, is not necessarily the right uh, way uh, to do it. So, thank you. All right. Yeah. One more or two more? All right. minutes so um, we'll take questions I think it's worked reasonably well we focus on one part of the room and then we move on so we'll start over here one at the front there one there and one there okay so if you could say your name as you, as you ask your question. sure thanks this is on uh, my name's Bronwyn I first just to thank all the speakers really interesting set of presentations I have a question for Emily in terms of the uh, cheating study so to what extent can we say uh, 
that the high stakes testing form itself is sort of at the root cause of cheating by creating sort of perverse incentives for teaching and learning. And then that is a more broader question um, on whether it's troubling at all to equate learning with the results on these high stake tests. Hi, um, Barbara Mensch. I have a question for Eduardo. Um, as one who does uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis and finds it often frustrating, um, uh, what about in terms of reducing heterogeneity to encourage uh, duplication of studies for RCTs to do exactly the same study multiple times? Wouldn't that help our cause, it certainly would help the analyst who's doing the, the systematic review who has to deal with the, with the heterogeneity, and this is in a sense a, a call out to donors that maybe we need duplication as best as we can, even though we know context will differ. One more, oh okay, we'll just stick to that side, just take the question at the back and then we'll come on to the middle okay. side. My name is Anton de Chaube. I thought that last presentation indeed particularly useful, but at the same time it does not really surprise me. And I'm not sure you're going to solve the problem by having more homogene uh, homogeneous strategies, let's say. I think the, the, the reason why you have the diversity is because the same strategy is implemented in very different contexts. And it, it just doesn't work in very different contexts. We all know that school autonomy works in some cases where you have a strong head teacher, a supportive community, and so on, but it doesn't work in other cases. So I think where we can get, and, and the fact that there is such diversity is not surprising because the contexts are so very diverse. And so the real challenge is to find the right strategy for the right context. And I'm not sure that, that whatever RCTs and so on we're going to use will be very useful as long as we don't emphasize the importance of the context. Okay, let's take those. Uh, so, Eduardo, a question on: Is it all diverse? Is it all driven by context? And what about replication? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so starting from from the last one, and of course, yeah, uh, definitely, uh, hundred percent agree with what you said, and uh, take it as more like a comment rather than uh, a question. So, it's uh, yeah, definitely, um, there is so much of it is driven by by context. So that's the whole point of uh, talking about heterogeneity. Uh, of results. Whether that can be picked up by a randomized controlled trial or not, it depends. I mean, it's, you can design a primary study in such a way to, um, uh, if not understanding heterogeneity, at least to, 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 to explore uh, how the mechanism uh, uh, works. For the other uh, question about uh, um, replicating studies, I think that's definitely very uh, interesting to uh, exercise. But I see it more like um, a, a type of uh, study for uh, again for understanding uh, um, 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 well there is a, there is a, a, um, an interest in confirming the, the results right uh, whether um, um, actually uh, you know there are some uh, studies finding very uh, amazing uh, results that, that of course do not replicate but just because it was a random uh, uh, chance event but I think in the case of uh, education where you know already there is a lot of uh, heterogeneity. I, I think uh, I, I would be more interested to uh, look at uh, different studies rather than replication of single studies. Yeah. OK, Emily, uh, high stakes, is, is that what's behind cheating? Yeah, so thank you for your questions. Um, this is, I think, a very important question that um, is still very much up for debate, and uh, it speaks a lot to the discussion uh, that Derek Neal started uh, on when you're measuring, like, do different things with the same test, then it kind of induces uh, cheating. So in this case, it would be student, student learning and school quality, so that kind of everyone in the system has incentives to, to cheat. Um, I think that um, high stakes, so, it could be a problem, but there are ways around it. So, for example, with the computer-based testing, it seems to be working and no one else, um, uh, or so far, uh, no one has really uh, found a way to, to cheat on it yet. And um, well, as, as long as you, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't know how to, but there's probably some smart people that can. Um, so. I believe that it, even though it is a high-stakes test, it does match measure learning at the moment. But 
um, the Indonesian government is actually also uh, lowering the stakes for um, for the students uh, on the on the exam. So it's no longer a requ requirement for graduation, for example, because they are very uh, motivated to make the national exam uh, a measurement for learning and um, yeah, not for other disruptions in there. Um, so I don't have like a clear uh, answer to this question, but I think it's, it, it is a, a, a very important debate that should be ongoing. Okay, great. Let's take three more from the middle section. Uh, so there, there, there. I'll come to you maybe at the, the next one, okay? Uh, okay. Hi, my name is Lisa Chen, and uh, my first question is for Melissa. Melissa, I was really interested in looking at your distribution of full coherency, and I was wondering if there's anything we can take away from the distribution, not just the mean, like some, I saw some wide variation, and how does that affect your thinking about potentially targeting policy interventions at different levels of bureaucracy? Does it tell us anything about the cost of doing business, for example, um, in, in different contexts? And then for Emily, um, I think we'll stick for one question each because there's many, many people asking questions. Um, okay. Hi, Nick Spool from South Africa. Uh, the question's for Noam, and it's about the kind of psychometrics that's linked to the equating process. So as I understand it, you, 48 of these 160 plus countries, are you taking EGRA data? So these are grade two students and equating this in a, trying to create a cardinal measure, not just an ordinal measure, that also then equates things like PISA, TIMS, SACMEC, PEARLS. And so the question is, is there risk in not just doing an academic exercise, but almost similar to the Justin's doing business drama that he had with the World Bank, similar to creating a metric that starts getting used for things like the Human Capital Index? And do you not have reservations about this kind of equating EGRA and PISA um, and thinking that that's not extremely suspicious? Thanks. Okay, I think there was one. Okay, great. Hi, Idalia Rodriguez. Um, my question is also for Noah. It's in the same way of um, equating and also in sense of sampling. Uh, all the well, some of the sources you mentioned, they're usually not nationally representative, and now you're giving an extra step comparing countries. So, if you could give more about the methods you used in psychometrics and sampling about that. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, so, no, do you want to take the questions on sampling and equating? Sure. Um, they're great questions, thank you. Um, I would say, so, so a few things. So one is in the data, it actually makes really clear what's happening. So I would say, let me kind of take the nationally representative. All, all of the regional assessments and, and um, uh, international assessments are nationally representative. There are, I believe, 31 of the agri countries are also nationally representative. Uh, so there, there is a, a large, I mean, most of the data is nationally representative, and that's kind of a core thing for, for this all to work, as, as you highlight. There is a subset of countries that do not have nationally representative data, and that's kind of very clearly asterisked uh, and, and kind of made clear. That's similar, actually, to PISA and these other assessments, which often will have a few countries where that's not the case, and then they'll, they'll make that clear. The, the idea of including those countries is sometimes some data is better than no data. We could have a debate about whether that's true, but uh, at least it's transparent and clear which is which. So, so that's kind of to, to that piece. In terms of the EGRA inclusion, uh, so the EGRA inclusion, there's a lot of kind of details that go into getting it to be uh, reasonable and make it make sense. Certainly, it's, it's not trivial, and there's a lot of debate about how to do that uh, in a good way. One thing is uh, with EGRA, it's not item response theory. So the, the underlying assessment, there's sort of some, some pieces there. Uh, but in terms of the kind of equating to PISA, so we actually, so because it's, it's subject specific and level specific, the EGRA data is, is related to the primary school scores. So it's uh, before you aggregate and when it's disaggregated, it's looking at primary and reading specifically. So all of the linking is done uh, within subject and within level to make sure it's the right proficiency uh, and that there's proficiency overlap. So even though you don't get item, there is a proficiency overlap and that's really, really important. Uh, in addition for EGRA, as, as folks who are familiar with EGRA might know, uh, there's different subtasks. Uh, and so actually for EGRA specifically, we're looking at reading comprehension, which is the closest thing that's conceptually similar uh, to what's used on some of the regional assessments, uh, where there's also sort of a reading comprehension component. Uh, and so a lot of work is done to make sure that those speak to each other within the right level, within the right uh, 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 subject, and even within that, within the right proficiency. Uh, and we do a, a gazillion robustness tests to make sure we're getting something uh, 
uh, that ends up making sense. But happy to chat more about the, the agro inclusion. Okay, Melissa, on the distribution mm -hmm. of coherence. Yes, thank you. I think that's a, that's a really interesting point. So um, what I showed you with the regression results very quickly was at the school level. We also looked at it um, sort of by that local administrative level across countries, and you see um, the same correlation um, at that sort of municipality or whatever the local administrative district is. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, we need to think more about that. I think the very simple takeaway for us, at least, is that looking above the school level matters a lot. And I think this relates, um, you know, multiple people made related points yesterday, including Ben, around kind of, you know, what level you randomize your intervention. And I think that that's very important. I think we need to think more about, you know, if there are any other implications that we could draw out from what we see in the distribution. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll take one last question from the middle section at the back. One question there. One question. There. Okay, I'll take the, the first question is at the back in the middle section. Okay. And then here, here. Hi, I'm Bela from IT Asar Pakistan and Pal Network. My question, since we can only ask one question, to know. Um, so in that larger global discourse on the global learning indicator, um, the bank has decided to launch the HCI. The question is that um, looking at SDG 4.1.1a, the lower primary, are we getting away from really raising the bar on learning? Or I mean, even though we are coming from uh, the PAL network doing lower primary, but I'm just wondering in that larger discourse, where does this all sit? And a related question is, so far in terms of the takers of HCI, um, where is it pitched at? The ministries of finance or ministries of education? So I don't think in the ministries of education we are seeing a lot of stir. Okay, uh, over to this side. Thank you, I'm Joe DiStefano from RTI. My question's for Melissa about the study you did on, on coherence or incoherence. Um, I'm thinking in, of Brian Levy's presentation yesterday where he talked about uh, high degrees of coherence but that aren't aligned to learning. So you have bureaucratic coherence and a low, low level performance trap as he referred to it. And if, uh, if you looked at anything besides de jure and de facto coherence and whether any of it had anything to do with what we would consider factors that would impact learning. Okay, um, one here and then we'll take one more to finish up. Hello, um, Alex Ionesto from CGD. Uh, it's a question for Noam. Um, did you include the new PISA-D result in the database? And how are you going to do with the update in the future in terms of if you have a new update, then you might have a new linking rate. So are you going to change back the result of the countries? Is it going to change the STI? Is it, a, is it an issue for you? Yeah. Hi. Um, um, uh, this is a question for Eduardo. Uh, my name is Asif Maiman. I'm a graduate student at George Washington University. Uh, Eduardo, um, in your opinion, as you said, that education interventions are maybe not as amenable to meta-analyses as other sectors. Within those sort of subsets of interventions, do you think there are those that are that are more amenable to meta-analyses than others within education? Okay, great. Uh, Eduardo, that seems a fairly succinct question, so do you want to start with that one and then we'll work back? Yeah, no, absolutely, it's a very nice question. I think uh, that the question really touches the point of um, addressing heterogeneity. So one of the first things you could do in a meta-analysis of this kind is to see what interventions, I can't see the person asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here there. Yes, the first thing you could do is actually <laughs> looking at uh, uh, how different uh, across intervention categories is the, is the expected range of, of impact, right? So as you said, in some cases actually the, the prediction interval can be, may, can be actually very narrow. And and, um, and and that's that's interesting in its own, right? So I think uh, um, it's probably something you will have to look at the data more uh, carefully, but it's, it's certainly one thing to to explore together with redefining uh, the, the categories uh, as well. So so I think if I understand, the goal is to have a more more homogeneous sample um, of of, inter of intervention where you know generalization is possible. Yeah. I think um, it would be a good way to proceed. 
name a very specific question on PZD and then uh, what's the bigger picture um, linking to the global debate? Yeah, definitely. Um, so on uh, PCD, that was not yet out when we finalized the data, so it wasn't included. Uh, but now it obviously is, is there, and so uh, it will be included in the, the next update. Um, just a note on that, I think kind of distinguishing between the various sources of, of variation is important. So PISA says older students, a lot of the data for the same countries was coming from primary school. And so when just looking at those, that is important. I think one of the nice features of this database is it does disaggregate by that, so you can get a sense of, of where that's coming from. Uh, versus kind of linking differences, versus uh, subject, versus level. So I, I think that's important. Uh, in terms of, oh, and then there was I was going to say, just the updates. I'm interested in those. Yeah, ones. definitely. So it's a, yeah, yeah, in terms of kind of how the, uh, kind of is the exchange rate fixed and how that will look in the future. So certainly that's, that's going to be tackled. Uh, and so there's ongoing conversations on the exact specifics of sort of which time intervals to fix it to. Uh, but like other indicators, there do need to be kind of updated and then rebasing, uh, essentially. So that will need to be a part of it. Um, on the SDG 4.1.1a, uh, very specific, <laughs> uh, it's a great point. We, we hope that these are both kind of speaking to the same agenda, which is putting learning at the center and, and also drawing attention to, to learning in early grades, which uh, the HCI version of learning is aggregated, but it includes uh, early grades. Um, it, uh, there's a few differences. So certain assessments are included in one and not the other. So I think over time, hopefully, those can kind of speak more to each other over time. And then there's also thresholds versus mean scores. Uh, so there's sort of conversations around, around that. But certainly speaking to kind of the broader goal in a similar way, but slightly different permutations. Uh, but, but I know that that's a conversation that's ongoing. On the piece of kind of which ministries are being engaged with, I, I might punt that to, to Penny for for the afternoon, it, I don't know if that's if that's going to be covered, but that's sort of on the rollout beyond the kind of construction of the index and kind of the human capital project. Uh, so I will will defer that to, to others uh, to speak to, but certainly it's a large effort, and I know there's a lot of conversation and and kind of pieces thinking about uh, how to maximize traction of the index in, in country. And Melissa, on the coherence possibly around uh, functions and tasks not aligned to learning? Yeah, to, to Joe's point. So thank you for uh, bringing that up, Joe. I think uh, I thought Brian's yes, presentation yesterday and I was excited to see him say that he thought that this didn't matter because it's good to have some some debate around this. Um, I think to me, you know, I haven't read the, the book and so it's hard for me to say exactly sort of what he's looking at and how closely it matches up to what we're looking at. But my initial thought is really that you know, uh, compliance and coherence matters depending on the processes that you're talking about. Um, and so obviously sort of process compliance with, you know, pushing pieces of paper around or whatever we sort of think as, as meaningless, you know, bureaucratic activities that we do. Yeah, I don't think that those would matter either. I think we started from the point of saying, okay, well, there are sort of core functions to making sure that the right inputs end up in schools. And so that's what we're looking at in terms of processes and compliance. So things like actually measuring student learning, um, you know, getting personnel management right, which we think is super important. So I think that there's, you know, baked into the approach that we, that we used is a focus on specific functions that we think would matter. Um, and so I think that that's, that's where we, we came from with it. And something we haven't done, we've thought about, but it seems a little bit arbitrary to us, is to look at sort of individual functions and you know, whether some seem to be more correlated um, with learning or not. But that's something that we've, we've talked about before. And if you have views, it would be great to, to talk about it. OK, great. We're pretty much on time, so I'll just very briefly sum up. Um, for me, I think the first three speakers were, was very optimistic. It told us that there were things that were possible in terms of methods and measurements. Um, it's possible to get a sense of coherence within the education bureaucracy. Um, and a startling fact, around something like 50% of tasks are um, <laughs> correctly um, uh, uh, people perceive that they, they correctly ha have their tasks, only 50% of the tasks. Uh, for GNOME, it's possible to get a sense of a global learning indicator um, and a startling factor around the flipping of the gender gap. I think that, that was uh, uh, very interesting to see. And for Emily, it's possible to get a handle on cheating in schools in Indonesia and a striking difference between the data in Indonesia and in the US and Italy. 34% of schools found to be cheating and inflating scores by up to 42%. Quite, quite remarkable. 
Eduardo, I, I noted more a sense of caution um, <laughs> and a challenge yeah. to us that in, when thinking about uh, undertaking studies, as many of us are, and we're reporting on over these two days, to think more about mechanisms if we're going to, to feed these in ultimately to um, meta studies. So thanks, everyone, for a, a thought-provoking thought morning on methods and measurement. Thank you.